He met the Prophet, he asked him, he spoke with him. The Prophet explained to him about the principles of Islam, but the Prophet said, please keep it quiet. Don't tell the whole world, it's still early days. Onais came back to Abu Dhar, he said, John Dub, he said, yes. He said, this man who I met is Al-Sadiq, Al-Ameen. I'm telling you, you have to meet him. His light, radiate, his face radiates with light. So Abu Dhar said, okay, very well, but how do I meet him? He said, well, you're not going to be able to go to him directly. I was lucky I had a caravan. You can't go directly. He said, so what's the way I'm going to go? He said, the best way for you is you hang around the cab. Just hang around there. Slowly get to know the people. When you get to know, somehow di indirectly go and visit him. Abu Dhar narrates that when I was standing outside the Kaaba, I'm standing there on the first day, I'm looking around. I'm looking, looking, nobody seems to recognize me. I don't seem to recognize anyone. I'm thinking, how do I ask them where is Muhammad? As in, it might be a dangerous time. So he said, I saw this young man. And when I saw this young man, I looked at him and I said, the young man looked at me and he said, you look lost here. Are you looking for anyone? He said, no, 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 I'm all right. I'm, you know, I'm just come here to visit the Kaaba and I'm just having a look around and there's many idols here and, you know, just looking. He said, okay. The next day, the young man came back to him. He said, you found the person you're looking for? He said to him, yes, as in, you know, we're enjoying the time here and it's good and so on. He said, are you sure you don't need help? He said to him, no, I don't need help. There's no problem here at all. He said, okay, very well. And he left him. On the third day, the young man came again. Abu Dhar looked at him, he said, young man, what's your name? As in, who are you keeping coming up to me? He said, I am Ali, son of Abu Talib. So he looked at him, Allahumma oh. salam. He said, I am Ali, son of Abu Talib. Abu Dhar said, okay. He said to him, are you sure you're not looking for someone? It's as if a relationship of love begins here. Because you know he'll remember this person for the rest of his life. So he says to my show, you're looking for someone. He said, I don't know if you know the person I'm looking for. I don't know if you know the person I'm looking for. So he said to him, what's his name? He said, Muhammad, son of Abdullah. He looked at him and he said, yes, I think I know him. Let's go and see him. So Imam Ali took him to that person who he knows very well because he's only brought him up all his life. So he took him towards the house of Rasulullah. Abu Dhar entered. When Abu Dhar, he narrates that I saw the face of Rasulullah, I knew that I was on the right path. I knew I had come to the man. He goes, my heart did not stop beating from my love for this man. I knew straight away. Muhammad wa Muhammad. He said, when I saw this young man, I knew that my heart did not stop beating when I saw the Prophet of God. He said, I saw the Prophet of God and I sat with him. I said, oh Prophet of God, what is your message? He said to him, my message is the belief in oneness of God. He said, Ya Rasulallah, I promise you, from the day I was a young man, I used to believe in the oneness of Allah. My tribe may have worshipped an idol by the name of Manat, the goddess of destiny, but I myself never ever came near that idol. He said to him, we believe in a day of judgment. He began to explain to him the principles of the religion. Rasulullah said to him, but one thing, Abu Dhar, don't go out and tell everyone just yet. Let's keep it a bit quiet between a few people. Abu Dhar said, don't worry, Rasulullah, I'll only keep it between a few people. He said, thank you very much. The next minute, Abu Dhar has gone to the top of the Kaaba. Oh people, my name is Jundab ibn Janada. I am also known as a follower of Rasulullah and I swear, that there is no God but God, and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Before you knew it, the whole of Quraysh was coming to beat him. Everyone came and punched everything out of him. And while he's on the ground, he's calling out, I only follow the Prophet, I only follow the Prophet, and they're hitting him. And he had to be saved by someone. He went back. The Prophet said to him, Abu Dhar, what happened to you? Just a few moments ago, you were looking smooth. There wasn't a problem. Now what's wrong? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I only told a few people, you know, about your message and so on. You said only tell a few. He said, but how did you reach this stage? He said, I don't know. So okay, very well. Just, you know, keep it to a few. We can't tell everyone. He went back out again. Oh people, I am Jundub ibn Janada. And I have come to tell you that there is no God but God. And that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Again, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al
Again, as soon as this happened, they came and they were beating him until Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah, saw them beating him. He came and he said, all of you guys who are beating him, I'll just give you some news. His family is Bani Ghafar. Everyone ran away. Why? Because you knew that we're going to go on a journey now. His dad finds out that his son's been beaten. You're not going to have a caravan, let alone goods in a caravan. They'll even take the caravan as well. So everybody ran away because that's Bani Ghafar's son. As in like, that's the son of someone in the mafia. You know, you're not going to mess about with someone like that because automatically you know you're going to die tomorrow. So what happened was that Rasulullah saw Abu Dhar, he said, listen Abu Dhar, okay, forget telling about everyone, don't worry about it. Do one thing for me. He said, what is it, Ya Rasulullah? He said, go back to Bani Ghafar. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you've just begun the religion in Mecca. What do you mean go back? I want to be with you. I want to be with Ammar. I want to be with Zaid. I want to be with Ali, son of Abu Talib, the young man who knows everything in this area. I want to be with all of you. He said, no, go back to Bani Ghafar. First your tribe, then the outer community. And that's a lesson for all of us. That first begin with your own community, then go out to the world and tell them. Sometimes you have some of us, our houses are about to break from the lack of religion, but we want to tell everybody else how to be religious. Have you seen the way your son is? Why are you telling about the whole world to be religious? Look at your son. First bring him, then make the world religious. You've seen your daughter the way she is? First go and tell them about the religion, then go and say he's good, he's munafiq, he's muqassar. You know all these terms are coming up these days. This man is a munafiq, he's Yazid, he's muqassar, I don't know. The worst thing is the ones who are saying it, you look at him in the face, you think, who even allowed you to have an opinion? As in you look at him, you're not even worth anything. But you find that they open their mouth, their houses are like straw, or like the house of the Ankabud, the spider, it falls. The Holy Prophet told Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, I don't want you to go and tell the whole of Mecca about Islam, go and tell Bani Ghafar first. Because they worship an idol. You go and change them. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'll go and change them. Do you know when Abu Dhar left, Islam was at the beginning. Do you know when he returned to Rasulullah at Khaybar? All those years he was away from Islam. He was with Bani Ghafar. He missed Badr, he missed Uhud, he missed Khandaq. He returned at Khaybar. When he went back to Bani Ghafar, Bani Ghafar, their head was called Ibn Nudba. When he went to Bani Ghafar and went to Ibn Nudba, you found that what had happened was that he came to him. He said to the head of Ibn, uh, to Ibn Nadba, he said to him, you are like a father figure to me. And he looked at Abu Dhar, he said, oh Jundub, you are like a son to me. What is it? He said, I've joined the religion of Rasulullah. I've joined the religion. When Ibn Nadba heard this, he said, don't worry. Does the religion make sense to you? He said, yes, it does. He said, explain it to me. He began to explain the holistic system of the religion of Islam. When he heard it, he said, very well, what do you want to do now? He said, I want to tell my community about the religion because all of them still worship Manat, but I want to explain to them why I don't worship Manat. So Ibn Nubba, because he was a man of justice, said to him, are there any intellectuals in Mecca who have joined Muhammad's religion? Why does he say that? If he hears that everyone who's emotional is a member of the religion, then without a shadow of doubt, what will you find? You'll find that what will happen is that he'll come forward and he'll say, well, these people are emotional. None of the intellectuals are here. Whereas if he finds out what? If he finds out the intellectuals have joined, then he'll join. Because naturally we want our mosques to be full of graduates. We want our mosques to be full of people who have read either secularly or in the main educational circles. We don't want our mosques to be illiterate without people reading. Because people get attracted when they see religions with people of knowledge. So what happened was, that he came to him, he said to him, yes, Waraqa bin Nawfal has been attracted by the religion of Islam. That's one opinion that was given. Another was Qais bin Sa'ad has been attracted by the religion. So what happened was when these two came, when he heard of these two, he said, very well, tell Bani Ghafar. Abu Dhar sat down, the whole of Bani Ghafar was sitting down. He said to them, I have come here as your brother and I want to tell you why I became a Muslim. They said, very well, tell us. He said, because of the urine of a fox. He said, sorry? Everyone's like, sorry, what do you say? He said, the urine of a fox. People are thinking to themselves, we thought he's going to say God, and he was at theology and justice and all these. He said, urine of a fox. We thought we're the ones who aren't educated. He said, Abu Dhar, what do you mean? He said, do you remember when we were younger, we take trips to Mecca? They said, yes. He said, do you remember when we tr take trips to Mecca, we'd always say, let's leave some milk next to Manat? They said, yes. He said, so do you know what actually made me join the religion of someone like the Prophet? They said, we don't know. 
He said, once you told me, go put milk. So I left the milk there. When all of you were going back to the caravan, I stayed sitting. I kept on staring at the idol and the milk. And I saw this fox walking past and it started drinking the milk. And when a fox finishes drinking, what does it do? It lets it all back out. And who did it let it back out on? The pe person or the idol that you worship. He said, if the idol can't it protect itself from the urine of a fox, how is it going to protect Abu Dhar al-Ghafari? Half of the tribe, why? Because rationally, not emotionally. When we talk of the message of this religion, you don't need to talk emotionally, brothers and sisters. Talk with this. We found Allah not through this, but through this. Likewise, in the religion of Islam, and the school of Ahlul Bayt especially, when you hear preachers who preach all emotional rhetoric, tell him, listen, we're human beings. We don't need 25, 45 minutes of emotion. Give us something which makes the mind actually click. Let us understand the religion from here, not just the whole lecture, emotional. You found that what happened was that they came, they said half of us will join the religion. Very good. Half joined the religion. The other half said we're not joining because a prophet of God should prophesize. A prophet of God, if he truly receives revelation from God, should prophesize. Meaning what? Meaning that he should receive a revelation that will happen and that will make us believe. And notice how beautiful religion's balance is. Sometimes you use intellect, sometimes you may need to use miracles. It's a balance. Some people, the intellect appeals to them. Some people know the miracles appeal to them. Abu Dhar said very well, my prophet told me before I came to you that you're going to ask this question. And my prophet said to me that one day, Bani Ghaffar will help me in the, date of the, in the land of the palm trees. At the time, Rasulullah was in Mecca. It wasn't the land of the palm trees. The land of the palm trees was Medina. So Bani Ghaffar said, well, Muhammad's in Mecca. He's not in Medina. If he happens to go to Medina, then we'll believe in him. But he's in Mecca and he'll never go to Medina because naturally Mecca is his home. Nobody leaves their home. You found that they waited and waited until Rasulullah established the message in Medina. When he established the message in Medina, Bani Ghaffar all became Muslims. But still, they hadn't joined the Prophet. At Badr, Abu Dhar wasn't there. At Uhud, Abu Dhar wasn't there. At Khandaq, Abu Dhar wasn't there. Until Surah 61 verse 10 of the Quran was revealed. Surah 61 verse 10, what does it say? Shall I tell you of a bargain that will keep you away from a grievous punishment? Those who give away from their lives and from their wealth towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Dhar, when he read this verse, when he heard it had been revealed, he said, you know what? At Badr, I didn't help Rasulullah. And at Uhud, I didn't help Rasulullah. And at Khandaq, I didn't help Rasulullah. And the Quran says that the best of people are those who strive with their wealth, are those who strive with everything that they have. He said, from now on, I'm going to go to help Rasulullah. And the first battle he reached to help Rasulullah was the battle of Khaybar. And when he came, do you know battle of Khaybar is great for Bani Ghaffar? Not just because Abu Dhar had returned, no. But also because Bani Ghaffar's women were the nurses at Khaybar. These women, who a few years earlier were worshipping idols, were now nursing the wounds of the soldiers at Khaybar. But one particular person at Khaybar, Abu Dhar looked at him and he said, this young man's grown. Because when he saw the performance of Amir al-Mu'mineen on the day of Khaybar, he remembered the young Ali ibn Abi Talib when he had seen him, only 13 years old. He now looked at Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Khaybar, 29 years old. And Abu Dhar on that day says, Ali ibn Abi Talib's performance on that day, I have never seen a performance like that in my life. Why? Because Amir al muminin as you know, on the day of Khaybar, he had an infection on his eye. He couldn't come out and fight. And so many of the other companions thought, well, considering he won the accolades at Badr and at Uhud and at Khandaq, maybe this is our turn. Maybe we may have a chance now that we win the accolades. But every single time the Prophet gives the banner to someone, they come back without victory. Why? Because Marhab, the head of the opposition, is not an easy man to fight. As in you're talking about a man who's the most ferocious of the warriors of the Jews of Khaybar. Nobody, nobody came near him. And you found that the Prophet knew that there's only one man who was able to defeat this man. But the man's got an eye infection. He told them, call Ali for me. They said, Ya Rasulullah, he has an eye infection. He said, bring him to me. When they brought him, he took some of his saliva. He touched the eye of Imam Ali. The narration states that Imam Ali said, I had never had eyesight better than on that day. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, what did he say? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said, We had all come back that night and the Prophet said tomorrow, 
I will give the banner to a man who loves me and Allah and